Samma Sambuddha Saranai. May all beings be well and happy. Good evening to you and a warm welcome to Dhamma and You brought to you by the channel I. So talking about uh, the life that we lead and the path that is required for us to practice and follow for, for us towards the attainment of the highest goal of Nibbana is the path that Lord Buddha has shown us and today we have an important personality together with us to talk about the practice of this path and I would like to welcome uh, Most Reverend Acharya Kema Sasmi Deepika uh, who has come from the United States of America uh, to Sri Lanka to share this knowledge with the people of Sri Lanka. Uh, good evening to you. And mm -hmm. uh, talking about the practice of Buddhism, uh, Reverend Kema, I'd like to ask you, uh, the most important tool that we need to use for the practice is meditation. So how can a beginner really get into this practice of meditation? Well, you know, uh, when I visited you last time, we talked a little bit about three pillars and we talked about activation of generosity. Mm -hmm. And in preparation for meditation, what the Buddha was actually teaching the monks was first to practice generosity of the mind, of speech, and of actions for people without expecting anything back. So this is the first practice, and the reason was to open the heart, to balance the heart for working then with the meditation so that the meditation would work better yes. okay so we talked about generosity we also talked about sila which was the support system and the precepts are important to use the uh, su have a support structure for the meditation okay and then the last part of these pillars was to have a, the bhavana which is development of those two practices so that's the foundation the first strongest part of the foundation mm -hmm. and then beyond that what happens is you have a few more uh, things that you need to add on to that um, and this is about the blocks that might sit on top the three pillars and we have three blocks that happen. Now we switch over to the more familiar um, sila, samadhi, panya. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the sila is still there and the, the, uh, the generosity is inside with the precepts and this is the sila base. Uh, the morality-based structure to help you be balanced with the hindrances not bothering you so much and your progress goes very well if they're not bothering you, mm -hmm. okay? And then the next part that happens uh, is the samadhi. Now, samadhi is interesting because samadhi has uh, different meanings and this is where most people call samadhi concentration, concentration and that's, that's yeah. where they say it's concentration. But samadhi is an interesting word. Samadhi can actually be broken into, and you can say that sama means tranquil, mm -hmm. and the D, the D-H-I part of it, is referring to wisdom. Okay. So now we have tranquil wisdom. So we're beginning to... Uh, find out where the name of the practice I teach came from. Okay. So we have tranquil wisdom. And because we have this balanced kind of uh, concentration that we use in this practice mm -hmm. that is not one-pointed, this is very important. We don't want to have pressure on the brain. We don't want to have the uh, brain pushing together. We want the brain to be open and relaxed. Mm -hmm. That's because in between the two lobes of the brain, okay, we have this little guy here who is the pineal gland, mm -hmm. and he sits in there between the two lobes, lobes. of the brain. Yeah. And when we relax and that opens, he can let the endorphins out. And the endorphins, are, are yeah. those are special because that's what helps you feel light and very mm -hmm. comfortable and happy. This is where your joy arises. This is what happens in the body. And so... We want this to happen, and in order to do that, we can't have a tight kind of mm -hmm. meditation. Now, you know I call the meditation tranquil wisdom. Insight meditation is the name of what we practice, and we call it TWIM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is our nickname. So when we talk about TWIM, we have the tranquility, the mm -hmm. gentleness, and we call this 
not an abandonment of uh, concentration, but a refining of concentration, level and quality. Mm -hmm. That's what it really is. And so it's a productive level of unification of mind. Mm -hmm. That's one nice way that some people have written about unification instead of concentration. Mm -hmm. And some people say collectedness, okay? And, and when you're uh, using that kind of concentration, it's very gentle and the mind can relax easily. So when you're learning to do the meditation, let's jump, let's jump into this a little bit more. And what we're doing is we're going to have an object of meditation. And we like to give people the loving kindness as the object of meditation. Why do we do that? We do it because everybody basically grew up using breathing meditation. And because mind is like a little child and listens very carefully to what you want it to do. And if you've been asking it to do this for a long time, it's going to slip back and you're going to start concentrating pretty hard on following the breath. So instead of asking you, please don't do that anymore, okay, and trying to wait for you to let go of that habit, what we're going to do is give you a new habit, a new kind of meditation from the beginning. So you would say for a beginner to start practicing meditation, uh, the meditation on loving kindness would be the ideal one to start. That's right. But not the meditation on breathing. Right. Now, a lot, there's a few reasons for this. Number one, of course, is to do something other than that and teach the brain that we want you to do things a different way. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to try to erase what I taught you. We're just going to give you a new uh, a new a habitual tendency to follow that's very healthy for the development of your meditation. But also, it's very difficult for you to start using the breathing meditation in life. Yes. Okay? We can use the breathing meditation at the temple. We can use the breathing meditation on retreat for periods of time. And you'll notice while you're on retreat, everything's just great until yeah. you go home from retreat and then we don't know what to do with the breathing meditation when a crisis comes up. We're not sure how to use the breathing meditation other than to go away from people and do it by ourselves. But the question is, was that the meditation that was part of life? Mm -hmm. And I don't think so. Um, and when we look at we look at how it's mentioned in the book in the in the um, in the text, we find, for instance, in the Majima Nikaya, the instructions for the breathing meditation are only there four or six times, but we find that the loving kindness is mentioned repeatedly through the text all over the place. And so there's no comparison. And we begin to understand that that's being taught a lot more often than the, the baseline breathing meditation. Now, it's not a worthless meditation. Let's be sure we understand this. It can calm a person's system down very well. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is it has led to the uh, in-depth breathing meditation sits here and the vipassana sits over here. And so we have separated these two. Mm -hmm. But in the text, they weren't separated. They're they together. were yoked together. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is interesting. If you see my hands, okay, you pretend these are two two bulls that are going to pull a cart through a gate. And when they're a team of bulls, a team of oxen, mm -hmm. they have to pull together. together okay? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that they pull on top of each other and it's happening at the same time, but there's two of them, they're yoked together, and they're going to pull. If we one is extremely good, it's going to go in circles. And if the other one is extremely good, it's going to go in circles. But we want them to pull straight through the gate and take us to the experience of Nibbana. Yes. So in order to do this, we had to look through the text and dig and dig and find out what was going on. And what we found was there were these places where it mentions this was yoked together uh, and the serenity and the insight or the samatha and vipassana were always mentioned in tandem. There's only a couple places in all of the Majima Nikaya where you're talking about what is this and what is this. Mm -hmm. 
but the commentary supported the idea of let's have this team and let's have this, this team. Yeah. And so now we have this separation. It's neither here nor there in a way because what we're talking about is an everyday solution. So let's say that we're in the office and you start yelling at me. And you come in and you're the boss and you're just irate. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a Monday morning and I'm sitting at my desk innocently looking at you and you're yelling at me. And I'm taking it very personally. And I say, wait, please. And you say, why? And I say, well, just a minute. I have to start my breathing meditation. Hold on. <sighs> okay, you can proceed now. You can yell at me. It doesn't it's all happen. going to work. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't happen mm -hmm. that way. Okay. But so in solving that situation, just as an example, um, it doesn't happen that way. So is there anything I could have done that would have been different? So what you say is uh, the practice of meditation on loving kindness could be a tool that can be really used to practically use in our day-to-day -day life, is it? That's right. It, you can use it in your everyday life. And what I want to do is I want to go into, uh, just go on over to a PowerPoint presentation that we have here. And I, uh, I want to um, take you through a couple points that are on here. It's just a little one, a little PowerPoint presentation. We can flip over to that now, okay? And we'll go through this a little bit. So this was about meditation is life and life is meditation. Mm -hmm. This is a book my, my, that my teacher wrote most recently All right. and, and talks about this point. Of it was actually supposed to be part of life. It wasn't supposed to be separated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how it's how do you reduce the stress and suffering at work and school? First of all, looking for that teaching, hunting for that teaching. What were they all doing? In the beginning, the Buddhist teaching was easy to understand for the wise, and wise has an interesting meaning I'll get to in a minute. Um, and then it was immediately effective in life. That's the second point. The third point was it was inviting inspection. You were so fascinated with what you were finding in this meditation. You wanted to go as far as you could to see where it would go. And then the other thing that we don't hear them say very often, but it's in the chant. Yes. It was untouched by time. Mm -hmm. That's key. That's key. That's very important. Because yeah. that means those instructions, if the same ones are here now, they'll work now just as much as they have worked then. Mm -hmm. The three pillars we talked about before were the dana, generosity of mind, speech, and action, the sila, which were the five what precepts, you? and then we talked about the visitors that come if you break the precepts, and we talked about how the sila was the five uh, steps to. Uh, top performance for the human mm -hmm. beings okay and bhavana is the development of those two practices but then we have the three block structure i mentioned to you where a sila samadhi and panya that's right sila samadhi and panya so panya what is this buddhist wisdom now here we talk about wise mm -hmm. okay wisdom is really an interesting word yes. you know because you know you look it up in the dictionary it says well it means you're wise Wait a second. <laughs> what what does, is wise? What, no, what does that mean? Question. So if I look at what wisdom is, mm -hmm. my son is a, a, a large ship captain All right. in the ocean. He has nautical wisdom. Mm -hmm. My sister-in-law is a, a, a tennis player, and she has tennis wisdom. Okay? Uh, I was a cyclist when I was younger, and I could cycle for hundreds of miles, and I had cycling wisdom mm -hmm. from my training, okay? So there's all these different types of wisdom, so the question is, what was Buddhist wisdom? What was Buddhist wisdom? Yes. Okay, so what we find is we want to notice how things work. We want to see how things actually are in this life, in this existence. So now we get to this little example, this little uh, picture of the um, practice. Let's put that up right. Okay. So we, our samadhi, our tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation is based on what right effort 
actually was in the Eightfold Path. And you and I talked the other night, and I said to you, I said to you on the phone, I said, what do you think of when I say the word effort? And what you said was work harder. And this is, this is the answer I get all the time. I have to put more effort into it to get it done, okay? But Buddhist right effort, that was different, okay? Buddhist right effort actually was a, a four-step system of recognizing when one of those hindrances pulled you away, one of those visitors pulled your attention away from what you were doing, and you would recognize it. And then the next two on this little wheel as you go to the right, where you would release your attention off of it. Because remember I said, don't give them attention. Don't feed those mm -hmm. little visitors. So this is actually how mindfulness play an important role hand in hand with right effort, is it? Right. The mindfulness plays an important role with the meditation. We didn't do that. I'll do that in just a second for you. I will, okay? Because you need the definition for meditation and the definition for mindfulness so you can see that these two are hooked together. Mm -hmm. These two are not separate issues, okay? The actual truth is that the, let's do it now, the meditation is the observing the movement of mind's attention so that you can see clearly how things actually work. Mm -hmm. How do things originate, the suffering? How does it pass away? How does it get more complicated what's the danger of it what's the escape yes. remember mm -hmm. we talked about that one other time so when uh, we look at this okay we see we should um, just recognize and when I recognize this what am I doing I'm using mindfulness now watch mindfulness was remembering to keep the observation going all the time not just when you're sitting in meditation on the cushion, but when you're walking everywhere. And it was not the outward observation, level of observation we're doing in Vipassana. We're learning a level of observation. Mm -hmm. We are. And now but, when you say that, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you how clear comprehension also play a role here. Right. Clear comprehension comes into mindfulness, mm -hmm. okay? Mindfulness is remembering to do the observation all the time and remembering what to do when you, what, what to do when it's time to escape from mm -hmm. the suffering, how you escape. Clear comprehension comes in of clearly being able to see the arising mm -hmm. of the suffering as deeply as possible. Mm -hmm. This meditation allows you to watch it on the surface and as your, uh, as your tension begins to lower in your body, mm -hmm. then when things are rising up, what happens is you see them earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. So let's just play for a second. The, the, the actual cycle of the practice is to recognize something's pulling you away and then just let it go, mm -hmm. release it, and relax the tension and tightness in your body and mind. And then you re-smile and you return to your object of meditation. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about loving kindness, you come back to that and continue to work with it. If you're at work and you're writing something and you've been interrupted, you come back to your task. Mm -hmm. So see, now we put it in life, okay? And then you repeat that cycle if something pulls you away. Not every single thought has to be let go of. Mm -hmm. Not every single thought needs to be... Um, relaxed away and we can't take parts of this this is very important we cannot take parts of this and just relax 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 or release 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 everything stops there's no progress if we do that so what how the the cycle works is to recognize when you're pulled away mm -hmm. release it relax smile and come back continue with what you're doing that's being mindful that's right that's being mindful, mm -hmm. remembering that and making it all work. The clear comprehension is how is this whole thing working? Mm -hmm. That's clear comprehension. And this is where the Buddha gives us even more information. Mm -hmm. Let's go one more slide here. These definitions that are here, they really help us to remember. We just said meditation and mindfulness. Yes. Uh, now I say delusion. Delusion means doesn't just mean your mind is clouded. Okay, Buddhist delusion, what it means is that um, it means that the um, delusion is the false idea that everything that's happening is me, mm -hmm. it is myself, okay? The craving, craving 
is the I don't uh, is the um, I don't like it mind or the I like it mind, and it translates. It translates from I don't like it, I don't want it. Let's make it stop, or I like it, I want it. Attachment. That's what we're seeing. Okay. So the attachment and aversion play an important role in the sansaric journey, and that's what keeps us in the sansara. It holds us in there, and the attachment and the aversion is driven by who? It's driven by Atta. Yes. So Atta, here's the Atta coming out and saying uh, that this is driving the dislike or the like, and the like is running into the attachment and then the aversion, okay? It's a funny thing. There's attachment in aversion. I wanted to know why are they teaching this about attachment all the time? And I said, we talk about attachment, we talk about aversion, and he said, think it through. <laughs> And I had to go away and think about it. If I don't like something, then I get so I, I get attached to trying to make it stop. You see, so I'm I'm not in the present time. So I, now the I, next question is how can I really look at things in its true aspect? Now this could be a question for anyone. Uh, you've been saying you need to see thing, things in their true aspect. Right. But how? You allow it to happen mm -hmm. because what you're doing in the process of this, these last two words or little phrases, purification of mind and retraining of mind, those two words that are uh, to be defined, the purification is this little system, this system of the practice, mm -hmm. continually doing that. Every time you do that, it's like you're purifying mind. But at the same time, you're teaching mind continually like a little child uh, you are teaching mind to uh, remember I don't want you to grab on and get tight mm -hmm. and cause tension and tightness in my body which then becomes the basis for stress which Tension. then which then becomes the core for the anxiety mm -hmm. and the frustration and the panic attacks and all of the other diagnoses that go along that bother you in the workplace it all starts with this mm -hmm. so i don't want you to do this anymore i want you to let it go i want you to relax i want you to smile and come back mm -hmm. and then the more you open all of the answers you're asking come, but we don't have to make them come. So does he leave us with just this diagram or does he go one step further? And when we look at this next diagram, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a little circle called dependent origination in Buddhism or Paticca Samapada. But we're also seeing something that's wonderful. We're mm -hmm. seeing that this is human cognition. Yes. This is the line of human cognition. And this circle is uh, notorious for spinning. This circle has 12 little pieces on it and is spinning at a very rapid rate of mm -hmm. 100,000 times very rapidly around and around. So we can't see that until we're way advanced in our meditation. But that's not important for us to have to see the, the momentary part of this, just the way it isn't important that for us in this life right now to see the broader base of this that goes across this entire lifetime. All what's, right. I what's would... more important is to see how it works with one event mm -hmm. at a time. That's very important. When you uh, showed uh, the slide of the law of dependent origination, uh, you've mentioned that this is what really drives us through this journey of life. Right. So how can we really apply this to all our day-to-day -day situations and put this into practice? I would like we to also... back up and we say, I'm not going to look at it moment to moment like this. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at it broadly like this. I'm going to look at it in my office with a problem with my boss on Monday morning. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. And so what happens to us, we, we take only part of what we need, which is this other diagram, mm -hmm. only seven of those links. Mm -hmm. Can we actually watch them taking place in, in life, okay? Now, how this works is like we have the six sense doors. Yes. Okay, so what we're gonna, you know, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and that experiences the outside part of our life. This is our exterior sense system. And then we have the mind, and the mind is the internal sense system for seeing how things work 
with mind and thoughts that come up. But let's look at the eye for just a minute. Okay, so if I have the eye and I take this bottle, okay, and come on in, let me show you this bottle, okay. If I look at this bottle with my eye, my eye doesn't see the bottle. My eye sees color and form. Yes. Okay? That's what That's I all see. all it sees. Yeah. Color and form. And then what happens is eye consciousness comes in, the eye, the color, and the form, and eye consciousness make eye contact. Mm -hmm. So what says next what happens is perception, perception, which is part of the being, the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Perception's job is to name this. This identify. color and form. So it says red drinking bottle to Sister Kema. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. And in Sri Lanka, usually I'm very happy that this drinking bottle is here. <laughs> okay. All right. So, That's so the, amazing how you've explained it. Yeah. So the eye sees color and form. Mm -hmm. Now we know it's a drinking bottle. And then mm -hmm. a a very nice, pleasant feeling comes up. That's the next thing that happens. And that's attachment. And not yet. We have no attachment. Mm -hmm. No attachment. This is just a pleasant feeling. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a point of confusion a little bit mm -hmm. because uh, what happens in psychology, and not all psychologists mm -hmm. go this direction, but in school they are kind of taught in this direction that feeling is emotion. But feeling is not emotion, emotion. okay? So in feeling, I am not there, mm -hmm. okay? And you can test this. You can, you know, slap your hand like this and watch the body make this happen. You don't have any control over it, but when I slap my hand, then the painful feeling, it goes through the nerves, up into the neurons, into the brain, okay. finally comes out my mouth mm -hmm. saying, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> okay, at ouch, that was when I moved to craving and said, I... I don't like that mm -hmm. painful feeling. That's the ouch. It was even farther along there. Mm -hmm. But what happens here is feeling is just feeling. Mm -hmm. It's just painful or pleasant or neutral. We can look at it that way. That's enough. And then when something happens and it's a painful feeling, I would say next in craving or tanha, I don't like this. That's all the craving is. I don't like this. Now you'll yeah. notice something happen here in the links that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Everything before the tanha is impersonal. Yes. You are not, not there. there. You are not there with the six sense doors. This is a body structure mm -hmm. and that's just part of you. You're not there before that mm -hmm. with mentality, materiality. You're not there with that before that with formations or consciousness. So only at this point you are really there you are there mm -hmm. so this is in the line of cognition this is the point where we have the first personal opinion right. the first personal opinion and then what happens is the next step happens very quickly mm -hmm. and you want to hold on to it more because instead of just saying i don't like it your mind goes i don't like it because and the story just flows out of your memory banks of why you don't like this feeling. Mm -hmm. And if it goes immediately from a little sprout of I don't like this to a huge, huge tree. tree. And that one is papancha. Yeah. That's papancha, where it bursts up and gets really big like this. And then... So, uh, mm -hmm. so I would like to ask you, so that is what really makes us to cling on to it, is it? This is feeling of grasping mm -hmm. in I don't like this and it gets bigger and stronger in the clinging. Mm -hmm. And then when we jump over to the next one, what happens is that's a habitual tendency. And this is your library is different than my library. However, you grew up is different than me. Mm -hmm. So I have habits of reaction and you have habits mm -hmm. of reaction. And human beings live 85% of their life reacting instead of responding. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, we get caught with just reacting, you see? So this library of reactions are there, and the next link that comes after that is the birth of action. Yes. And action, action is a mental action, a verbal action, and a physical, physical action. action, okay? so. What's happening is from the point of craving, this is very personal. 
Now, if it was a painful feeling and we get down to the birth of reaction, and the untrained mind is always going to have a birth of reaction, it's not going to have response. Okay, but once you understand all this, you can relieve yourself by eliminating these one by one, which I'll show you how you can do that, okay? But the birth of action happens, and then what happens? You have aging and death of this event. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if the event in this case um, was a sad thing or a painful thing, like you yelled at me, mm -hmm. and I heard it, and it went through the ear system, mm -hmm. and we got to this point, the aging of this event, before it's over, before the death of it, we have sorrow, lamentation, pain, mm, grief, grief, despair mm. that's going to happen inside of that. And the degree of that suffering is directly proportional to how well you understand this. Yes. You see, can you laugh at it and not take it personally? Because you understand the Nietzsche, there's a piece of knowledge that helps you to let things go, go. you see? Or are you going to take it very, very personally? Mm -hmm. And are you going to grab a hold of it and think about how you can get back at the other person, which is not so good? Okay, that's how we get war. Okay. And that's about really understanding what reacting and what responding is about. Right. It? And this is the journey of the behavioral modification the Buddha was doing. Was originally, we talked at, well about his very first attempt to at figuring out what this is all about, and he looks at what's it like to live in unwholesome situations or wholesome situations. The unwholesome is the reaction and the wholesome is the uh, response, okay? So then finally what happens here is that um, if you want to understand how this actually can heal mm -hmm. or shall we do some situations, we have a choice here. <laughs> But, um, yes, I would like to ask you, uh, why don't we elaborate as to how this practice can be really done in our normal day-to-day -day situations, perhaps in the school, in the office, at your home, or anywhere Well, okay, let me tell you, there's a doctor that I taught to do this um, who is a gynecological surgeon oh, in, right. in Australia who um, he was a person that had a, a cancer situation okay. and was very, you know, terminally ill. But so he was uh, very much in anger about this having happened to him, but he was still working and everything and he was in remission. But he didn't know what to do about the way he was behaving with people and everything. So by teaching him how this all works, especially the dependent origination, he was able to see that he's taking everything way too personally, way too seriously. And the other thing is he experimented with working at the hospital by, um, you know, not to be, well, too general, but surgeons are not always the most loved people in the hospital, okay? And I worked in many hospitals, so it isn't always that everybody loves the surgeon's disposition, okay? And uh, he was kind of in that yeah. group, okay? Mm -hmm. But he turned it all around. Okay. So he took loving kindness, and as he's practicing the practice of loving kindness and learning how to build the power mm -hmm. of loving kindness, and our practice is different. It's not mm -hmm. reciting it. It's not by rote. We're, we're teaching you to go back to the beginning of the loving kindness practice and discover that you have to work with one person first, yourself, and then with one person until there is a response. In your mind, it happens that there's a response and a relief. Then you start to graduate into other forms of people, other kinds of people, mm -hmm. and then you graduate over into uh, working with the directions later right. on, okay? And this is naturally changing from metta into karuna, into the lo compassion, mm -hmm. and the karuna is changing into the... Uh, into the joy and the joy is changing into this incredibly balanced state which he was experiencing this the uh, equanimity doesn't come like there's equanimity it's no, not like it's that not like it that, happens yeah. gradually when you're doing this kind of practice and you're going through the different levels as you're passing through it's getting stronger and stronger and so what was happening he went to the hospital and started using loving kindness with the nurses just sending it to them mm -hmm. Not saying it to them, but sending it to them. And he started feeling better, and he started forgiving people. When he started to play with the forgiveness meditation, he started using this meditation, and he started saying, 
my goodness, everybody needs meditation. Everyone, everyone needs to be forgiven. It's a wonderful thing. Everyone's changing. And I said, you're changing. And he said, no, I couldn't be affecting people. And I said, you're changing. And the light that's coming from you is changing other people. This is how we affect the world around us. This is how Buddhism got so big as it expanded outward, because when your light gets turned on and you start shining, then it starts to affect the other people around you, okay? So this is one thing that happened for him in a workplace. This is similar to the doctor here in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. who is working in a hospital who's changing the way, sharing with the nurses what oh. she's learning, and the nurses are changing. So mm -hmm. they're willing to accept the workload. They're willing to accept the situation better because they understand about a Nietzsche. It's a real thing. Start remembering about a Nietzsche. Don't just say that we know what a Nietzsche is. But start playing with it and doing it, okay? And then, uh, then we take a person in the workplace who has a really bad time with somebody in a work structure in a corporation. And when we find something like that, we have to look very carefully at what's going on and listen first to what's going on between the two people. But then we find out that actually if one person understands this, both people don't have to understand it, but if one person understands about the, what's happening with the human cognition line, then they change the whole situation between the two people mm -hmm. because they don't react anymore. You see? Yes. And so instead of, like, if you come in the office and you're my boss and I'm here on Monday morning and you come up and start yelling at me mm -hmm. and I can't stand this anymore, it makes me feel so bad on Mondays, and somebody teaches me this, what happens is eventually when you walk in and stand in front of me and you start to yell at me, I don't see you anymore the same way. I start seeing you in a movie. I start seeing the steps of what is happening for you. I start seeing a person that has a painful feeling mm -hmm. and they're not happy with it. Yes. And the uh, habit, habitual reaction for them is to react and throw something at someone else. And I'm sitting there and you're throwing it at me. But now all of a sudden I see the pieces of the play, the pieces of the film happening. One of the ways we look at this uh, discovery of how this all works together for us in life is most people have been to a movie. You've been to a movie. Of course. Yes. So you saw a movie, real, mm -hmm. but you didn't see the film. I bet you didn't see the mm -hmm. film. Yeah. And the film is made of frames. Mm -hmm. And each one of the frames, when they go in the editing room after they make a movie, yeah. they edit the frames and hook them together where they want to make the movie the way they want it to be. The Buddha actually took human cognition and showed us that we don't have to be in the movie. We don't have to be caught in the movie. We can step outside the movie and watch, watch the person it. who has the painful feeling go through this experience of getting to the other side of their problem. We can, we can do that. And um, so when we start doing that, we're taking everything impersonally. We are watching mm -hmm. the, uh, the actual cycle of human cognition in front of us. One of the best places to study human cognition is the airport or the train station. Mm -hmm. Right. You see all these little dramas going on or sit out on the street and just watch the street for a long time and watch what's happening between the people and how it works. So this is, this is what's happening with this human cognition. Now the question is, um, you, I'm explaining this to you, but you're still thinking, well, what, how is it really going to help me? How is it going to help me progressively? Once I take you inside the editing room and show you how the movie's made, now you understand the frames of the film. So now you can let go of the reaction, the birth of reaction. And you can realize every time I react the same way. And you can step back and say, you know, I'm not going to run that story in my mind about why I don't like stuff mm -hmm. so badly. 
And you're going to be left with craving at the end, where you're going to jump into saying, I don't like it, but you're going to stop. Yeah. You remember the practice we talked about. Mm -hmm. Each time that you release something and relax, you lower the tension in your body. You see stuff arise earlier. Okay. And gradually, your, your mind shifts, mm -hmm. and it becomes automatic. You don't have to think about this practice of letting go and relaxing and coming back anymore. It happens automatically. That's amazing, uh, Reverend uh, Kema, for giving that inspiration for us. A long journey starts with a single step. So we need to gradually walk along this path uh, towards the attainment of the highest goal of Nibbana. Sama Sambuddhisattva.